we're going to get to a great portion of this program. And I'm going to ask the three doctors to please come up and take a seat at our round table. Oh, it's not round? Come on up anyway. So for tonight, I want you all to please thank, you know, we can't do our programs without getting supported by those in the pharmaceutical industry who really, really want all of our audiences to learn from our programs. And so we reach out to get support from the pharma. And for tonight's program, I want you all to thank Sanofi Genzyme to start with. All right, round of applause, everybody, for everybody. All right, then we have Biogen. All right, EMD Serono, Celgene, Malincrot, and Novartis. And I want you all to say thank you to all of them for allowing us to do this tonight. Great, perfect, thank you. Dr. Rapovich, Dr. Casey, and Dr. Bott. So let me, let me read a little bit of something of each of them to you so you just get a general idea of who they are, all right? Then during the course of this program, I'm gonna be asking them questions, all right? And we field these questions from all over the United States from where we do our programs, all right? I just have to find the questions. All right, then um, when we give out seminar evaluation forms, lots of people ask lots of questions. And so we're always figuring out how to best present this, present this back. And we do these roundtable programs in many different portions of the United States. And what we do is I put together the questions, or our team puts together the questions. We send it to the doctors so they're a little bit ready. We're going to ask them each to speak for about 60 seconds on some questions, 45 seconds on other questions. Now, before we begin, let me just read a little bit about Dr. Casey. And by the way, I don't have my glasses. It's very hard to read, especially when they wrote small. Dr. Casey completed medical school at the University of Michigan and her neurology residency, where she served as chief resident at UCLA. She went on to, she went on to an MS and neuroimmunology combined fellowship at UCLA and Cedar sinai Dr. Casey now works as an assistant professor of neurology and takes care of patients with multiple sclerosis and other related neuroimmune conditions at the Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. It might be the wrong strength. <laughs> All right. Dr. Casey conducts research on tools to improve our ability to accurately diagnose and properly treat MS. Let's welcome Dr. Casey. Next, we have Dr. Rapovich, who a lot of you all know from the local area. Dr. Rapovich, neuro, neurologist, fellowship trained in multiple sclerosis, recipient of the Sylvia Lowry Fellowship from the National Multiple Sclerosis Society, medical director for neuro, neurology research and Swedish Neuroscience Institute. He's clinical investigator on, in several clinical trials in relapsing and progressive multiple sclerosis, including those leading to the approval of Ocrevus, Jelenia, and Lemtrada. Let's welcome Dr. Repovich. <laughs> Wave your hand, say hello. <laughs> and Dr. Bott. Dr. Bott is a board certified neurologist with special interest in multiple sclerosis and research studies. Dr. Bott trained at Stanford Hospital and Clinics, Stanford, California, where she completed her residency in neurology and her translational fellowship in MS and neuroimmunology research. She was faculty at Stanford, supervising the neurology clinics of neurology residents and winning teaching award from the Stanford medical students. She has published articles and authored chapters in top journals such as the Proceedings of the National Academy of Neurosciences, Multiple Sclerosis, Neuron, Nature, Medicine, and the Taraskin Clinical Neurology Pocketbook. Let's welcome Dr. Bott. Now onward, we're gonna do this randomly, all right? So I may start with one doctor. We're gonna let each of them answer in the amount of time that I give them to answer, and then we're gonna move on to another question. So let's start with Dr. Casey on this first one. Now for each of you, we're gonna ask you to speak for 60 seconds each, okay? And let's talk about progress. Maybe you can each share with us what you find to be most remarkable progress in today's treatment options, diagnostic tools, and management of MS versus years ago. 60 seconds. 
Right, an excellent question because there's been so much exciting research in MS. It's one of the reasons I went into this field is it's progressing by medical standards, lightning fast. It may not feel like that to us or to our patients, but if you compare it to other areas of neurology, it's really been booming in the last few years. And all you have to do is look at the list of therapeutics that are available to us when a patient is first diagnosed. A lot of the medications that we use most often today, at least in my practice, weren't even available to us a few years ago. And these are some of the medications that we consider the most effective in MS. So that's been a huge change. Uh, the other big change is, uh, I cut off my 60 seconds? Yep. Um, the other big change has been in diagnosing MS. This is something that I'm very interested in on the research side. We still have a long way to go. It's still very much a clinical diagnosis based on the patient's story. Um, but our tools, our ancillary tools that we use, such as our MRIs, have gotten much stronger and much more accurate. And there's a few more tools just over the horizon that I think are really going to change our ability to diagnose the disease. Great. Thank you very much for that. Dr. Rupovich? Let me get my 60 second timer going here. All right, so the most important, no, I'm just kidding. So um, to me, obviously, this abundance of therapies we currently have has been the biggest change can you from- speak closer to the mic? Closer to mic. Can I hold this thing? Sure, you can. Okay. So um, to me, that just abundance of options has been the biggest change in the last few years. Um, and with this richness of therapies has come actually a new set of goals of what is it we think we can do for our patients now than a few years ago. We can actually try and shoot for you know, prevention of any relapse or any new lesion of the MRI. Is that necessary? Well, time will tell, but we can try and get there. It still leaves open a lot of other unanswered questions, which leads me to that sort of other thing that uh, Dr. Casey just mentioned, which is how much is left to do, but how much more optimism we have for that. Ooh, my second seconds are up, so. Yeah, totally, go It's for in it. front of you. So for each of you to notice, there is a timer in front of you, and you can just look at that now and count back your minute from each segment. <laughs> Got it. So. I agree with uh, everything that uh, Drs. Casey and Repovic have said, but I just wanted to add an anecdote in terms of how far we've come. So when I first moved to the Pacific Northwest, it was about six or seven years ago, and I inherited an MS practice from a doctor who was really just trying to do other things, close to retirement and just trying to see a very specific set of neurological diseases and not MS. I, I kept in my training, uh, compared to the way it was in my training to the patients I was inheriting, I kept, uh, you know, after two and three and four patients, I was thinking, why are they in wheelchairs? Um, did, did he not do a good job? Was he not treating them with the disease-modifying treatments, uh, that we, therapy options that we have? And it was a patient who actually said to me, no, Dr. Bot, I had my first one or two or three uh, severe relapses before 1993 when our first disease modifying treatment ever came out and I was in a wheelchair in 1992. So we have actually changed the landscape of MS and changed the course of the disease and that's extremely encouraging and gratifying. So the second thing that I will say is um, so that's in terms of everything, diagnosis, treatment, and everything. Um, the second thing I will say is our goals now, as Dr. Repovic said, we don't even want one new spot. And then lastly, we have a lot of research that we are doing in terms of things like biomarkers for both. Um, can we predict who is going to have a bad course of MS early on? And also, can we predict which medication is going to work best for which person? Perfect, thank you for your answers. Next one, we're gonna ask the first person to answer in 60 seconds and then you each other just 45. So now you gotta do a little bit math about what you see in front of you, all right? So our question is this, let's talk about progress. Maybe you can each share with us, am I on the wrong thing? I am definitely on the wrong thing. This is an MS moment, all right? All right, in talking about gaining a better understanding about MS, can you each explain why MS is different in every person? First burn, Dr. Rapovich, can you speak first? Sure, so MS, MS these days, people talk about it as a snowflake disease, each one is different, so that's true, and, and, but not unique to MS. Most autoimmune diseases are like this, because the immune system that we all have is different, it interacts with the world we live in, and each of us experiences that world in a different way. So when you combine a fairly complex set of circumstances, 
just like the weather, you're going to end up with anything from sunshine to snowstorm and in between. So people do f follow very different um, sometimes trajectories with MS. The general paths can overlap and some similarities between people who follow those paths can become apparent once you group them into larger groups. But still, it is a pretty difficult to predict a disease on an individual or a group level um, because, of, because of the number of variables you have. Great. So Dr. Bott, you get 45 seconds, and then Dr. Casey, 45 seconds. Again, for everybody out here, we're going to do this first, and then at the end, after all this, that's when we're going to turn to the audience to ask questions. So I really like the snowflake analogy, uh, but I wanted to add to that a little bit more information that uh, what we think about how MS is caused now is that the immune system, for some reason, um, that we don't know as yet know, has gone slightly awry, so it is not 100% accurate, and for some reason it attacks our own central nervous system, which is the brain, spinal cord, and optic nerves. Now, it's uh, not only is it like a snowflake, but also, and not only does it attack the myelin in the central nervous system, but in different people, the MS can even attack different, have an affinity for different parts of the central nervous system. Like in some, in some people, their MS is more in the brain, in others it's more in the neck, and in others it's more in the mid-back, for example. Dr. Casey, thank you for that, Dr. Bott. So uh, I agree with everything that's been said on this subject, and I think this is such a, a fascinating question, and it really speaks to how little we understand about MS. What causes MS? I think if we knew what caused MS, we would understand why it's so different in every person. And the reality is it's, it's probably a very complicated answer and multifactorial, even in a single individual. And I think of it probably as a perfect storm of genetics, environmental exposures, uh, childhood exposures, family risk, and things like that, that all come together in each person. So it, this question really speaks to our difficulties these days in trying to diagnose a disease and to give an accurate prognosis early on, but we're working on it. Great, thank you. Dr. Bott, 40, in 45 seconds, can you please explain benign MS and relapse-remitting MS? Okay, so in medicine, we like to do this thing called categorizing. We try to take a population that has a certain disease and put them in buckets and then see if we can provide more information in terms of how other people in that bucket have done in the past or how they will do. And this helps us guide treatment, diagnosis, prognosis, etc. In the same way that there have been uh, many iterations of trying to categorize people with MS. And one of them is this. And even more, as recently as one or two years ago, we had yet another iteration. So even this may be slightly, it's a moving target. And so um, just like everything in life, MS, uh, I believe, is also a bell curve. So some people are more severely affected, others are more, more mildly affected, and most people are in the middle. Now, I'm not sure that um, everyone would agree that there is a condition such as benign MS. It may just be a milder form of MS. And to every given individual, we know that to you, your MS is not benign in any way. So, and then in terms of relapse and remitting MS, um, this is a, the most common form of MS. In that, in that categorization. And this is where a, a person might have an attack or an exacerbation, followed by a remission, either complete or near complete. And uh, this tends to be a more inflammatory phase of MS in the early years. Great, thank you. Dr. Rapovich, can you please explain in 45 seconds a little bit about secondary progressive MS and active secondary progressive MS? So secondary progressive MS is a label or a designation given to a patient who had a relapse in the past, either one relapse or they had more relapses. Maybe they were diagnosed with relapsing remitting disease to begin with. And somewhere along the way, what changed was that between their relapses, they were not stable anymore. They started actually changing and gradually accumulating more problems, usually related to walking and their MRIs weren't changing, and they weren't having relapses, but they noticed that whatever the problem was, it gradually kept getting worse over the span of months. That's progression. So secondary progression means it's secondary to a relapsing course initially. A, different, a difference between active and non-active 
uh, secondary progressive MS has to do with what active in our MS nomenclature means. And active means that a patient had a relapse or that their MRI had new lesions. So if a person is progressing, in addition to having a relapse <clears throat> or a changing MRI, then we say they have active secondary progressive MS. And contrary, if they are not having any MRI changes or relapses, then they're not active. As a rule of thumb, it's this non-active group that is much larger, maybe four-fifths of secondary progressive MS and patients have that particular phenotype. Thank you. Dr. Casey, can you please explain primary progressive MS? Sure. So this is the least common subtype of MS. It's uh, characterized in about 15% of people with MS. And it's in the name. So it's primary progressive MS, meaning slow progression, which is not I went to sleep fine and I woke up and my right leg wouldn't work, but more of a story of over the last six months, my the strength in my right leg has gotten a tiny bit worse every day to where now I'm needing a crutch. And I can't name the day that it happened. It's just been a slow, gradual change. The primary part of that means that that's how the person's story with MS starts out from the very beginning. And that contrasts it to secondary progressive MS, where as we heard, starts out with relapses. People with primary progressive MS start out with a progression from the very beginning of their disease course. Excellent, thank you. Dr. Bott, let's start with you on this one. 60 seconds, Can how do you relay or explain to your patient, possibly a newly diagnosed patient, and care partners, how MS really works? First, I'm glad you said care partners, because especially if it's a new diagnosis, it's very nice to have, and it's almost crucial to have their care partner, who, so uh, or some sort of support family member there. And it really does depend on, um, it's very complicated, and it depends on um, what information needs to be relayed. So sometimes, most of the time, it's not urgent that all the information be relayed the first time. So it could be just about going over the MRI or the test results that lead us to the diagnosis, and then uh, provide some information, and then maybe have to be broken up into more than one visit. Thank you. Dr. Casey, do you have anything to add to that? About what causes MS, that was the question? Yes. To, yeah, I, mean, I, th I think that uh, you brought up a great point, Dr. Bott, which is not everything can be communicated in the first visit. So uh, as, as any of us who've ever gotten a medical diagnosis or any sort of bad news know, half the time you're not really absorbing every single piece of information that's coming your way. So uh, in that initial visit, uh, I try to touch on the fact that it's an autoimmune disease and some of the symptoms that might come off uh, come from having MS. So it's an autoimmune disease and which parts of the body specifically are affected and what symptoms someone might have from those effects down the line. Great, thank you. Dr. Repovich, let's start with a new question. Can you touch, touch on the prevalence of MS, gender, race, regions, genetics, epidemiology? Can you do that in 45 seconds, please? I'll try. Um, so what we, tend, what we know about MS is generally that it is more common the further away from the equator you go, either further north or further south. Why that is, nobody knows. There's a, some theory that perhaps it's related to the sun exposure, and the less sun you get, the more likely this condition may be. The genetics play a huge role, and the racial Genetic background plays a huge role. This disease is more common in people of Northern European ancestry. Uh, Gender-wise, this is more commonly diagnosed in women than in men, at least in its relapsing form. In the progressive form, the primary progressive group actually tends to be diagnosed later in life, in the 50s, and the gender split there is roughly 50-50. And what was the third, fourth item? Geography, yes. Within our country, we tend to have Sorry, <clears throat> within our country, we tend to have higher prevalence in the northern reaches and in the northwest, one of the higher, um, but not hugely higher. I mean, I've seen these billboards the about what is it in the, is it in, is it in the water, is it in the soil? It's not like we are 10 times more common here than anywhere else. So don't, don't get too carried away with epidemiology. 
Dr. Casey, can you add to that? Sure. So it's, uh, especially in the relapsing forms of MS, it's a disease that's diagnosed in the late 20s or early 30s on average, although there are no rules. It can be diagnosed at any age. Uh, it affects women about three times as much as men, especially in the relapsing forms. The primary progressive form tends to be equal between the sexes, which is an interesting distinction. And then uh, there are racial differences. We're still kind of trying to figure those out. It tends to be more prevalent, prevalent in Caucasian populations, less so in Asians. Uh, and the severity might be higher in African-American populations, too, based on early epidemiological studies, although there's no defined cause and effect studies as of yet. Dr. Bott, your turn. So uh, I have not a whole lot to add to all the factual information that you've gotten, except to maybe say that um, no one factor is 100%. And then there is also this theory that something has to uncover it. So the immune system has to somehow see uh, damaged myelin in some way to uncover it, whether that's a viral infection or injury in some way. And also that uh, even the genetic penetrance is not 100% because you'll have identical twins that maybe grew up in other areas or not even everything else was identical, but one has uh, MS and other doesn't. Thank you. All right, going forward, let's talk about, let's get into communication. So let's start with Dr. Casey on this one. What do you find specifically works in your practice when communicating with patients and family members? 60 seconds. It's a, a very interesting question. So I, I think one of the key things is meeting the person where they are. Uh, some people come into my practice the first time and they've received the diagnosis and researched it all night long on Dr. Google, uh, or they've had the diagnosis for 10 years and are very well read and have a lot of personal experience with it, or they, they know someone who has it and that's been their research, is talking to that person. Um, I have people who come into my practice who have are perfectly healthy and have never been to a doctor before, and then I have other people who come in and they are physicians themselves. So taking a second to understand where that person is, what their relationship with MS is, at that point is really important to making sure that you can communicate with them effectively. Dr. Repovich. So one thing that I like to do, and then my patients can attest to this, is that I write my note, especially the last part of my note, the plan of my note at every visit, with fully with the intent that my patients actually read it, just like I will next time we meet. It's a bullet point list. It's like, this is what we're going to be doing. This is what you're going to be doing. And then we go through that you know, at the end of the visit, and then we go through that as well next time they come back. So, <clears throat> sorry, I just keep like not holding this close enough. So, so that's what I find helpful, now that you didn't hear it, um, <laughs> in terms of communicating with my patients, trying to stay on the same page, visit in, visit out, so that we know what we're doing, what we're changing, and what we're not changing. Great, Dr. Bott, can you add to that? And do I have 45 or 60? <laughs> you get, you can, you can have 60. Okay, which is good because I, I like to think of it, think of three important things in communication with my patients. The first, as there are many of my patients in the audience today, you will know that I don't like to use jar jargon or fancy words. And I don't think there is a place for jargon or fancy words in any aspect of any field, not only medicine, but in other fields, because everyone really should be able to communicate well about something. And the second thing is, um, uh, I like to uh, have patients partner in this discussion, and so I will advocate that they bring a list of things that are important to them, because what there is important to them may be different than what's important to me. And um, it's all important. <laughs> so, and then uh, lastly, I think uh, as much as possible, uh, well, by that I mean without devastation or with trying to figure out how much uh, information a person can handle, to try to be as honest as possible about what we are dealing with at that moment. Great. Thank you much. Now, we might have asked this question similarly a little while ago, but I'm going to say it again, and I'm going to ask Dr. Repovich to speak, but he's got to hold the microphone up this time. And we're going to ask, what are your feelings about patients attending their appointment with a family member or a care partner? Most of the time, I think that's a good idea to bring somebody else with you. It happens very often that a, a person with MS may not be aware of all the things that their care partner notices. Sometimes we all engage in uh, denial, and perhaps there are things that need to be attended to that my patients don't notice 
or would rather not really talk about. They may be embarrassing or something. So that's where it's really helpful to have someone else in the room who says, well, actually, this is what I've noticed. Sometimes it can backfire, right? So there are different dynamics that can get set up, of course, with people, partners, as well as relatively just not so close people. So there is a time to be there solo, and there is a time to be there with somebody else. So I personally think it's kind of good to mix it up and sometimes show up with another person, and, another, and other times actually come solo. Because there are things perhaps about that relationship that they want to bring up. Um, a very common issue is sexual dysfunction. And people don't like bringing this up. And sometimes they don't like bringing it up even more when the person they're actually intimate with is in the room. So there are times when you know, counterpart is great, and there are times when they're not. Dr. Casey, can you add to that, please? 45 seconds. I'm not sure I can add to that. That was kind of a perfect answer. Uh, but I would say that one of the times when it is very important to have somebody there, if at all possible, is early on, because I alluded to this earlier, it can feel like a fire hydrant of information is coming at you. And having somebody else there, uh, sometimes I'll see the, the care partner taking notes, which is nice also. But just having somebody else there to try to absorb this and that so you can put your heads together, compare notes, bounce ideas off of each other later, uh, I think is very helpful. Helpful. And then the other, the other scenario where this person is helpful also is in noticing things that the patient might not be noticing, especially when cognitive issues, memory issues are coming up. That person can be very helpful. Personality issues, um, mood issues, the care partner is often a really nice uh, ally for the physician and the patient. Great, thank you. Dr. Bott, we're going to start with a new question for you, okay? Thank you so much. You're very welcome. <laughs> because they've already covered all the ground. <laughs> very welcome, very welcome. By the way, you mentioned denial. I thought that was in Egypt. <laughs> gotcha, okay. Dr. Bot, can you please explain, could you please define or explain the most ideal circumstances or the reasons for a comprehensive MS healthcare team and what that would look like? Sure. MS is a very complex disease, and so it really does um, deserve a, an entire medical team. So the first part of the medical team is you the uh, patient or the person who has MS. The second would be your primary, uh, the doctors, the primary care physician or the neurologist. And then uh, because MS can affect so many systems, because your central nervous system basically f uh, functions in controlling your body, um, you have, you can have uh, physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists. Um, certainly mood resides in the brain. So you might need your counselor or psychologist. Um, the spinal cord is a great relay of function for urinary issues, so the urologist is important. And as Dr. Repovic mentioned, a urogynecologist or you know, uh, somebody who takes care of sexual issues as well um, and focuses on only that in a visit, for example, if needed. And finally, we, we forget sometimes about the social worker because as we heard from uh, the previous talk about this landscape of insurance and uh, you know, um, stay at work issues, all of these things are, sometimes I, I myself, you know, you feel like you need a PhD in all this to really care for the person with MS well. Thank you for that. Dr. Repovich, how can you add to that? I sometimes feel like a primary care doctor. I'm not, but I sometimes feel like a primary care doctor who's trying to manage this multifaceted disease. So I have to know a little bit about everything from bladder to psychiatry. And then I also have to re realize, you know, I don't know everything, right? That's fine too. And I need the help of these other specialists to deal with it. Our time is limited, right? That we interact in the office and covering all the bases is sometimes virtually impossible in a single visit. You have to have other people to whom you can refer your MS patients to get that in-depth knowledge. You know, once you haven't done so well with two or three antidepressants, I try. Well, that's the good time to bring in a psychiatrist on board and kind of see what else they can offer, for example. Um, what I think of, though, as, as the most important job that I do uh, in terms of this village approach is trying to identify what is from MS 
and what's not from MS. MS is, as you said, a huge diagnosis. It's like a Velcro diagnosis, the elephant in the room. And sometimes people with MS feel, and some of their doctors feel, that whatever happens to them is from MS. But you have to remember, people with MS also get heart attacks, and they you know, get bone fractures, and they have other problems, which can get missed because they get attributed to MS, and everybody thinks, well, it's you know, par for the course for MS. That's where you have to have your neurologist usually take the lead and recognize what is and what isn't from MS, and then go with that. Great. Dr. Casey, thank you for that, Dr. Rafovich. Dr. Casey, we're going to start with a new question for you. If you don't, what, what do you tell patients if they don't have access to an MS center with a comprehensive healthcare team available to them, what would you recommend in place of this? So early on in the diagnosis, I would recommend that they seek out an MS specialist, if at all possible. I know in some states we're a few and far between, um, but especially with the changing landscape of new therapeutics for MS and new diagnostic tools, it can be very difficult for even a general neurologist to keep up with all the available options. Which medication is the best for which patient? How do I diagnose them uh, appropriately and safely? And so checking in with an MS specialist early on in the diagnosis, making sure that you're on the right path, and then part partnering with a local neurologist to carry out that path is a great option, if at all possible. So that's, that's one of the things I would recommend. Great. Thank yeah. you. Dr. Bod, anything to add to that? Um, I would just say that the key in having a comprehensive MS team is that they all communicate with each other. So even if they're in the same institution, they have to communicate with each other. And even if they're in, you know, one city versus another, or they're not all in the same institution, the communication part is the key. And in that, you guys can also be advocates because it's so easy for the medical records department or you know any uh, sort of fa um, facility to drop the ball on records exchange Thank or you. communication. Dr. Reprovich, new question. Understanding treatment options. Today, there are many options in regards to treating multiple sclerosis. How do you recommend a person living with MS choose what might work best for them? So I have this table that I use that I create and update periodically and that tries to summarize these drugs <clears throat> and, and kind of explain them in a non-daunting manner. But it's not, it's always confusing. It's too much information. But we keep going back to that table. We start from it at the beginning and then we keep going back to it every time the therapy needs to change, if it needs to change. I explain to people that there is really no way to know ahead of time what will and what won't work for them with 100% certainty. So it's a best educated guess. I narrow down that list of 15, 17 available drugs to two or three. And then we talk about those two or three in some length. And most of the time, people reach some decision or conclusion at the end of that visit, but sometimes they need time. And then I send them home and tell them, read up on these, and let's meet again in a couple of weeks and go over this again. Because I ultimately strongly believe that this decision of any drug needs to be partly yours, large part yours, because you're the ones ultimately taking them. Dr. Bott, in 30 seconds, can you add anything to that? Yes, uh, I would say that we have, like Dr. Robovic said, we have no crystal ball and there is no one right answer. And if you ask different neurologists, you'll get different answers. So what I like to do is treat uh, the person and the person's MS with as uh, adequate or as uh, strong a treatment that is needed and that they can tolerate in terms of risk tolerance as well. Thank you. Dr. Casey, 30 seconds. Uh, the, there are a lot of different options out there. There's 16 or 17, and I see people come to me and they said, my neurologist said this was the one drug that I should take for my MS. And then I see other patients who say, well, my neurologist gave me pamphlets on all 17 different options and told me to pick. And so those two extremes are unacceptable. I think, as Dr. Robov was saying, picking two or three, narrowing down the list, 
going over the pros and cons of those two or three options that we feel is right for that person's particular MS, and then giving them a little bit of time to choose. It, it's, it, there's no right answer, but it can feel like a really big, daunting decision. So giving them a couple of weeks to sit with the information, running some tests to see which ones they're eligible for, and then having them come back with what's usually a whole list of very good questions, and then making the decision is my usual strategy. Great. Take a quick breath because I'm about to ask you a long question, all right? Dr. Casey, we're going to start with you. In recognizing and managing multiple sclerosis relapse, what are common experiences related to an MS relapse, and how would you best want to see someone who feels they may be experiencing relapse communicate this with their healthcare team? Mm, okay, so I'll start with some of the most common symptoms. So these are due to the areas that MS typically attacks. So an MS relapse should last for more than 24 hours. So uh, a minute or two of tingling and one finger is probably not an MS relapse. And I know people can, uh, especially early in the diagnosis, feel that any little twitch or tingle is the MS. It's a very scary time. So keeping that time frame in mind and that it should be at least a few hours and over 24 hours to qualify for a relapse. And MS relapse is usually numbness or tingling or weakness in one part of the body, so an arm or a leg, uh, or blurred vision with pain in an eye. So those are the, some of the most common relapses. And as far as how to communicate, this is so different from doctor to doctor, from office to office. So I think understanding what the best communication methods are early on, what happens if I do have a relapse, should I go straight to the emergency department? Is there a nurse that I have to try to get a hold of? Is there an electronic medical system? How long should I wait before expecting a call back, right? What is your usual time frame of response? All of those are good questions to ask before you really need to know the answers. Thank you. Dr. Bott, um, staying on the same subject, but what can you add to it that, what do you tell people that if they're calling and calling their doctor's office and they can't get anybody to, to justify or make an appointment for them, what do you suggest that they do? Um, first of all, find another neurologist. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, I, I would say, I, I would say that, um, most MS relapses are not an emergency. And to add to what Dr. Casey said, that um, if you're in doubt as to whether you're having a pseudo relapse or a real MS relapse. So a real MS relapse, what I'm calling real, my definition is that the immune system is refiring up and going and attacking a certain part of the central nervous system. A pseudo relapse is maybe a recurrence of symptoms of an area that's already scarred or has, a, has damage from a previous relapse because of some um, intermittent or reversible process. And that could be overheating or an infection or other a fatigue or loss of energy for other reasons. So when in doubt, communicate with your neurologist in whatever way that has worked before or that you guys have decided will work. And uh, there is, at least you should be able to get an answer as to how soon you need to be seen. Great. Dr. Repovich, do you have anything to add to that, please? I think we all run through these mental algorithms when we get these phone calls, patients calling with symptoms. And the first question that comes to my mind is, are they new, are they old? If it's the same old stuff in the same place, my suspicion for true relapse is somewhat less. Possible, but somewhat less. If it's a completely new part of the body, completely new symptom, I'm more worried about it. That's the first distinction. The second is, what else could it be? I've already told you, heart attacks and other things unfortunately do happen. Just because you have MS doesn't mean you can't have anything else. So other possibilities, are there infections, are there some other kind of things going on? Does it sound like MS? It's a joint pain. No. MS can do a million things. Joint pain is usually not one of them. So it's kind of things like this that we get run through and we're like, okay, what, you know, what is this? And because my patients usually are not interested in just this answer, yes, it's MS, no, it's not MS, because if it's not MS, they want to know, well, what is it? <laughs> so, so you have to be able to go down that path. Um, ultimately, it's this dialogue. Typically, our patients call and talk to nurses because that's the fastest way to talk to somebody. And then we go through this path. But we don't really have a perfect distinguish. Like it's all about pattern recognition. And if the pattern doesn't fit, be patient. Wait with us. Call us the next day and tell us how you're doing. Just because I don't think it's relapsed today doesn't mean I don't want to hear from you again, right? So sometimes it takes us time. It takes time for these things to just manifest better. 
Great, thank you. We have three questions remaining, but we're gonna hit on each of you for all three, okay? And so, Dr. Bott, let's start with you first. In seeing so many individuals impacted by MS in your practice, what are your recommendations to patients in regards to setting goals and priorities in both their personal life and in personalizing their plan for wellness? First of all, they, just like every human being really that has any chronic illness, they need, certain things will need to be planned, like pregnancies or like other life goals. So it's important to discuss with your partner what your life goals are. Many of us only have a one-year plan or a five-year plan and not like a 10-year plan. When you have a chronic illness, you might need to sit down and think about a 10-year plan. Um, and that could be any chronic illness, right? Not just MS. So... And once you've done that, there's no real reason that because you have MS, especially these days with all the tools we have for early diagnosis and early treatment, that the important goals in there cannot be something that need to be attained, that, that can be attained. And then that's something you should discuss with your doctor. Thank you. Dr. Repovich, your response. Hold the microphone close, please. For, can you repeat that question? Seriously? <laughs> What are setting goals? Is that setting what? goals, yeah. yes. All right. I don't know if I talk to people so much about setting goals. I ask them about, well, usually they ask me, well, does this mean I can't fill in the blank? And I like to say no, that doesn't mean you should totally do this. It, MS should be in your background of your life, and that's my job to make it kind of there. But sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes we are already behind the eight balls and things, ball, and things have already changed. So, you know, trapeze artistry may not be in your immediate future because it will be dangerous, right? And so it's my job sometimes to say, no, that doesn't sound like such a great idea. I try not to do that very often. I really, really do. But I also want to be realistic, right? So in terms of that's what in terms of setting goals but one thing i did want to mention and i honestly don't know when i don't think there's a question coming up about this another thing i try to imprint on or impress on my patients is that they shouldn't blame themselves for this disease so often especially in the newly diagnosed patients they think oh is it because i smoked pot in college that this happened or because i you know skydived off of wherever so no since we don't know what caused this most likely, none of the things you did actually did cause it. So this self-blame leads nowhere other than to some negative places. It's counterproductive and probably not necessary. So that's one thing I always try to impress on them early on. I'll take a much more granular uh, view of the question, which is how to communicate your goals to your doctor in your visits. Um, go in prepared have an agenda, make it a reasonable agenda. You can't address 17 issues in one visit, right? And make your agenda known early on in the visit because they're working with a certain time frame of how much they have to accomplish with you in, in the 20 or 30 minutes or however long they have. So make sure you say, you know, today I'd really like if we covered A, B, and C and say that early on. And if you're prepared and you go in with that, a lot of times I know people leave and they feel like the doctor did all they had to do, but then they didn't get their questions answered or they didn't get their needs met. And so go in with your goals explicitly uh, spelled out for yourself and for your doctor. Great, thank you. Next one, where do you see the most benefits for the person living with MS and care partners when important aspects of wellness, getting important aspects of wellness into their daily life? Dr. Repovich. I think this is one of those things where non-traditional medicine has really one-upped us. You know, this idea of holistic approach. and It, it sounded a little bit woo-woo when I first started practicing. And then I realized, you know, so much of what patients experience day to day boils down to this concept of wellness, however you define it. Is it decent diet? Is it exercise? Is it good sleep? Is it fatigue management, whatever that is, and it's usually an amalgam of these sorts of things, translates into wellness to, for anyone. So for us to be able to actually discuss that, we are a very prescriptive society. People want a diet, they want an exercise plan, they want sleep schedule. It's not so easy, and it doesn't exist, frankly. So, but. It's important to emphasize it because at the end of the day, when it comes to fatigue management in MS, which is super prevalent and quite limiting, 
It's this that probably carries more benefit to you than any drugs that I can prescribe. And so one has to be a little bit humble and recognize that. And there's, and it's not so only just fatigue. Dr. Bott. Yeah, so first I will say that I, that I agree with everything Dr. Ropovic said and that um, uh, wellness so can include symptom management. So we are really good at uh, having lots of options for, for patients to change the course of MS, to prevent new relapses, to prevent new changes on MRI, and to prevent new disability. But we, what, what feels like wellness to you on a daily basis is a daily symptom that is managed well. So we have to focus on that as well. And secondly, um, the, in terms of uh, data, I think there is, for what you can do at home, I think there is, in my opinion, good data to take vitamin D and to quit smoking. These are the two big interventions that you can make for yourself to change the course of your MS. Dr. Casey, you have 45 seconds. So uh, because I'm in LA and practicing there, I spend a lot of my time talking about diet with people. And uh, I haven't noticed people really change the way they feel with diet, but I have noticed something. If I can get my patients to start doing this, they inevitably come back saying, I feel like a new person. And this is a shout out to Jeff and to Gretchen, and it's exercise. If I can get my patient to start exercising and working out to a level that's appropriate for them, they come back brighter. I can see the change on them. So that's one big wellness aspect that I do try to steer my patients towards discussing during our visits. Great, thank you. Our writer, Jennifer Falk out there, just gave me something else that she wanted me to ask you all. And so there are a couple of questions left, but this is gonna be on mental wellness, all right? And can you share with us the importance, Dr. Bott, let's start with you. Can you share with us the importance of discussion of mental health issues with your patients? Depression, things like that. Sure. So. Um, it, again, it's really important to wellness, to how you feel on a daily basis. So like Dr. Upovic, I am comfortable with a handful of medications for treating m mood, things like depression and anxiety. And then I also think things that you can do at home, like try to get uh, good sleep or have good sleep habits can help with mood and uh, cognition on memory, mood and memory. And the other part of the care team that we failed to mention that's really important is a cognitive psychologist. So somebody that measures and keep tra keeps track of uh, memory. And in my office, I do a quick and dirty, like two minute memory test, right? But if, and if there is a deficiency on that, or if there is a symptom, a complaint of it, certainly they, a person requires a more involved memory test. And the same goes for, for mood. There is a quick, short and quick, a couple of nine questions and seven question um, questionnaire for depression and anxiety respectively that I can do in the office. But beyond that and beyond, you know, about five medications that not being a psychiatrist that I am comfortable with, I would refer the patient to a, a more appropriate provider. Dr. Rafovich? Um, so just touching up on, on these questionnaires, we rolled them out last year, and it was actually interesting for me, these are questionnaires for depression and anxiety, to realize several patients I didn't think were depressed were. And they, they, there was a lot more to this history than I ever thought. So. For those of you who find the questionnaires annoying and kind of a nuisance, why do I have to fill this out again? Please recognize these are our quick surveys, basically trying to figure out, is there something to worry about here? If there isn't, great for you. Circle the zeros and move on. But sometimes there is more to it. And it's really helpful if you partner with us in, in doing that. So I, I found this to be actually remarkably useful. Dr. Casey. So there, there's such a stigma around mental health and depression that I think it really bears saying that the MS itself changes the brain in a way that makes the person more likely to have depression, right? I just, I just go down the list of symptoms I'm asking a person about. How's your bladder? How's your walking? How's your mood? How's your fatigue? It's just one of a list of symptoms that MS causes. So I think that's a really important thing to recognize. It's second only to fatigue as the most common symptom that people with MS have. So starting from that point and just making it something we talk about at every single visit, I think is very important. And then taking a personalized approach to addressing it. A lot of people aren't comfortable starting out with a medication, but they are comfortable talking to a therapist. And so it's, it's a, a sticky issue and it's very personalized and so trying to kind of meet the person where they are and lead them to the treatment that they might be willing to, uh, to investigate is a good way to start. 
Great. Thank you for that. Our final question of the night has to do with symptom management. Okay. And many believe that they take a disease modifying therapy that their symptoms will improve, but this is not always the case. Starting with Dr. Casey, can you explain why? Absolutely. So the disease modifying therapies have one job and that is to stop the MS from causing any future damage, from causing any future inflammation, damage to the brain, the optic nerves, and the spinal cord. Their job is not to go back and fix any of the damage that's been done. That would be wonderful, and there's a lot of people working on medications to do just that, called remyelinating therapies. But the disease-modifying therapies are more of a, a future forward-looking therapy. I, I call it an insurance company, basic, or insurance policy for your brain and your spinal cord. The rare case where it does allow somebody to feel better are in the patients typically who have a lot of inflammation at the time that they start a disease-modifying therapy. And so if the therapy quiets down that inflammation, those patients do feel quite a bit better. But that's really not what we're looking for them to do. Thank you for that. Now, before we close this portion, I would like you, first off, thank you for everything you've done. But right now, I would like to ask each of you one at a time in 30 seconds each to please relay one important message to the active MS community here tonight, those that are watching online. What you would, what would you want it to be? What message would you like to give each one of them? It's Dr. Casey. Okay. Wow, just one message. Okay, uh, I think one overarching message, um, especially somebody who has family members with multiple sclerosis, deals, you know, cares for people with multiple sclerosis every day, is that there is so much hope out there. There is a conference starting today of thousands of people who work on MS, researchers who are forwarding our treatments and our ability to diagnose and treat and care for people with MS. There's many conferences throughout the year for such things and just a lot of research moving very quickly. So I just want everyone in the active MS community, as you put it, to know that there is a lot of hope out there and a lot of work being done on the problems that we're currently facing. Thank you. Dr. Repovich. Um, stay engaged. Stay, stay very much involved with this community. Um, none of you wanted to have this disease, and I would love to be able to take it away and make it go away, but we're not there yet. The, the MS, if anything, is a poster child for neurology community because of how much it has accomplished through the effort of people living with MS. So the MS Society and other organizations have truly funneled a lot of money and effort into curing this disease. We're not really close to the cure, unfortunately, but we are certainly closer now than we were 20, 30 years ago. With your engagement, involvement, and this remarkable power of community, of those around you who want to help, you can actually move things forward. And I've often been really humbled with how people do that. So it, it is actually in your power to change the course of it. Dr. Bot. So they really stole my answers. <laughs> but That's how it works. <laughs> anyway, I will probably say the same things in a slightly different way. One is be your own advocate because there's no better advocate than you. And the second thing is that we have certainly come far since 1993 and changed the landscape and the face of MS, and we have a ways to go. And so if you have an opportunity to join a research uh, trial, like Dr. Casey was mentioning, um, we want to continue that kind of groundbreaking work in the next you know, 20 years as well. Awesome, thank you. Everybody give them a round of applause. Very good, very good. All right, so we're going to continue now, all right? We're going to continue, though, from the patients and the care partners' perspective. We're going to go around the room. Jennifer's going to be out there. We're going to start with a question over there first. What I'm going to ask you each to do is answer in only 30 seconds. We're going to expect that. We're going to have a lot of questions out here, so we're going to ask you to answer them quickly, all right? Let's start with this person on this side of the room. Thank you so very much. First, I just want to say thank you for bringing up the mental health aspect of this illness. I don't think it's discussed enough, enough. We just lost a 28-year-old wonderful man in my group because he was diagnosed with MS and he didn't want to live any longer. So my question to you is if you have a patient who has mental health issue problems in their family, 
the top seven of my medications, depression and suicide is number one. How does that impact us as a patient? How does that impact us in our family, our friends? It's hard to jump around. Y'all, who wants to take it first? I forgot, I'm not well, directing. I'll go, go with it. Are you specifically asking about the side effects of your top seven medications as yes. having potentially side yes. effects? Yes. I was on 4,500 milligrams of gabapentin for 10 years, and when I came off that medication, it spun my brain into mania. There's only one other case that my doctor has found in my particular situation, and I am truly a snowflake. I was diagnosed with MS, secondary progressive MS, transverse myelitis, acute transverse myelitis, longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis, and neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder. So, right. So, so with, with regard to the mental health stigma, I think that recognizing and treating mental health in the context of multiple sclerosis care is not a one-time deal. It's a journey, and it's, it can take you to unexpected places, sometimes as a result of side effects of medicines. But as Dr. Casey mentioned, most of the time, what we see is this effect of MS and the damage it has inflicted on one's brain. So managing those, managing that, um, monitoring it over time, and keeping that communication channel open with our patients is super important. Questionnaires is one way to try to gauge the risk of suicidality, which of course is the worst outcome of untreated depression. Um, but there are other ways too. But I think that we all have certain sense of red flags and when we should truly consider this an emergency. And so we hope that with your help and maybe some other tools, we can, we can be helpful in preventing this. Thank you. If anybody, if either of the others ever have anything to add to it, please do, but take turns on who's gonna answer, okay? Okay, next one. Speaking of pain, um, I was diagnosed in 1989, long before Dr. Bott, long before even Dr. Johnson. But early in that diagnosis, I was having a lot of pain one weekend, and I called into the service, and the doctor I spoke with told me, if I had pain, I couldn't possibly have MS. I disagree with that, and I'd like to know what your opinions are. Well, I'm not going to answer because I, we'd like to get a second opinion. Oh, that's your opinion. Okay. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, well, as I'm sure Dr. Bott has told you, uh, it's, um, that's categorically false, that if you have pain, you cannot have multiple sclerosis. It's not typically one of the first symptoms of MS. Those are typically numbness, weakness, or vision loss, as I mentioned before, but certainly those things can lead to pain further down the line, whether it's uh, neuropathic pain from a spinal cord injury or the spasticity that comes after a muscle is trying to recover from weakness. So pain is a huge aspect of multiple sclerosis symptom care. It's not something that's addressed by the disease-modifying therapies, and oftentimes it's a very personalized approach approach. Um, the typical, you know, opioid pain medications don't work very well in MS. They don't work very well in a lot of the neurologic conditions. So it has to be a thoughtful plan for addressing each individual's pain, trying to figure out where it's coming from and what sort of treatments and or pharmaceutical medications that person will best respond to. And it's, it's not usually the first answer that's correct. It's usually a process of trial and error and tweaking the treatment plan for each person. I would say for everyone, and not just for Lucy here now, that you can get things like nerve pain in MS. And the other point I wanted to make is that when you have a, a brain or spinal cord, central nervous system that's inflamed, or when you have fatigue from that, pain from anything else that you might have, and as Dr. Repovic said, a person with MS can have other things, migraine, um, joint aches for other reasons that can magnify pain of, for, of any cause, so. My question goes along with this whole pain. Um, my wife complains of stabbing pains and is just kind of in pain at all times. And what are the effects of CBD? That's the new wonder drug. Is it, is it a go? Is it a no? What are, you, what are your thoughts on the, trying that as an option? 
<laughs> so, so CBD stands for cannabidiol, and it's one of the active substances in cannabis. The um, use of CBD in pain management in multiple sclerosis um, in, and cannabis in general actually is supported by some data. Is it the first thing that we reach out for when we're trying to treat neuropathic pain? Probably not. Why? Not because we're some stuck-up Western medicine practicing people who look down on you know, cannabis, but because we truly don't understand this drug at all, um, this, this herb at all. It's natural, true, but it has all sorts of other compounds in there. When you look at the scientific sort of genealogy of cannabis, it's a hodgepodge of promiscuity. There's like three parent strains and bazillion offshoots. And, you know, it's very, very hard to know what it is that you're actually getting when you go to the dispensary and you get a particular preparation because you don't know if it will be this, even the same plant from batch to batch. So when you're dealing with such a moving target and you're using it to, to treat another moving target, which is pain that fluctuates from day to day for any number of reasons, you really are sometimes in an unpredictable place. Some of my patients have found CBD to be very helpful adjunct to the rest of their treatment. Some of them haven't. It's hardly been a panacea that's worked out for everybody. There were times when I brought it up because we've tried literally everything else. And in those situations, it's actually been sometimes disappointing to me because darn it, you know, it's supposed to work better than all these other things. And it kind of didn't. Typically, though, when it comes to pain, especially this kind of intractable, life-affecting, kind of limiting type of thing, I don't think a single X intervention is ever going to be the solution. I don't think it's going to be CBD. I don't think it's going to be drug. I don't think it's going to be meditation and, I, you know, physical. But maybe combining these approaches. So there are these different programs that are called functional restoration programs where they loop in a bunch of different specialties and put you through essentially a mini camp of living with pain. Because that's ultimately the goal that we sometimes strive for. If we can't get rid of the pain, well how do you then contain it and live with it? And that's perhaps the only advice I can give to somebody for whom pain is such a central and limiting aspect of their life. Thank you for that answer. Thank you for the question. Next one. Can MS affect your autonomic nervous system? Uh, I would say yes. The autonomic nervous system also has uh, myelin that can be affected by MS. It's typically more rare. And some of the autonomic system resides in the spinal cord. So the answer is yes, but it's uh, we don't notice it commonly as one of the common presenting relapse episodes or symptoms of a relapse or even uh, a symptom of progression too commonly. Yeah, I would just say that I, I would agree with doc, Dr. Bat's comment. It, it does affect autonomic system where you can notice this or where I've noticed it in some of my patients is in their gastrointestinal symptoms or in their circulatory problems. Often in the weak leg, it tends to be colder or redder or somehow regulates that vasodilation a little bit differently. But in the forest of things that MS can cause, it's usually just a tree. It's usually not a whole half of a forest or major, major part. And actually, just to jump in again, urination is mostly autonomic. And MS affects urination in a big way. So the answer is definitely yes. Do we have any other questions? Great. I like running. <laughs> go ahead. Go for it. My question is, um, I think it's great to go ahead and um, advocate for yourself and speak up for MS. But I don't care what the law says, this day and age, it still results in you getting fired. All I can what say can is we, it really What can we shouldn't. do about that? Get a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> a good one. The MS Society, if you go to nmss.org, and I have postcards in my waiting room about this, but they have uh, these... I don't know if you call them webcasts, but you can go and click and watch videos. And they have a very good video about 
jobs and workplace issues with MS. So, so there are some legal caveats to, to what you bring up, right? Uh, firing somebody purely on the grounds of them having MS is illegal, but there are many workarounds, unfortunately, and sometimes they are used against our patients. What I found to be helpful, at least in those situations, is to work with a vocational counselor early on. These are people who are usually quite knowledgeable about employment regulations, and responsibilities of the employer and um, also of the employee, right? So requesting an FMLA with 10 hours of absence five days a week, that's probably not reasonable accommodation. Finding some middle ground between your limitations and what your employer can accommodate, that's the job of a good vocational counselor. And then working with you through this, through the whole continuum of MS, as your MS gets worse or better, so that you can adjust. And there may come a time when disability becomes inevitable and necessary to discuss. And at least at that point, there will be a track record of what your limitations were, what has been tried, what has been maxed out, and what didn't work out. And that typically is how you know, this, these employment issues can be resolved, I think, to a, you know, some reasonable way. But the disclosure, in other words, telling people about your MS diagnosis is a huge thing. We generally don't advertise, we don't, don't recommend that people sort of put it up on their Facebook page because it might really affect their employability prospects. It shouldn't, but it may. And so, Knowing who needs to know and sharing this at least initially only with a close circle of friends until you learn the ropes a little bit. That's my advice to newly diagnosed patients. Great. Thank you. Last questions over here. Okay. <laughs> um, I admin in Stewart's uh, Facebook group and a question or a concern that's raised constantly is whether or not people with MS should take va have vaccines or get their vaccines and it could and right now we have big vaccine debates going on in our state so can you just address you know flu vaccines other kinds of vaccines do they cause MS should they be something we should be updating and so forth I can start with this as I was reading a review on this on the plane on the way over here this morning. So <laughs> um, it was a 2018 review done in France of all the available literature to answer exactly your questions. So the, uh, the main takeaways are that one, vaccines do not cause MS. There's no literature that supports that. And then in fact, there's collections of literature and observational data that show that, it, that they do not cause it. Okay, so that's, that's one. The other question that people ask is, well, if I have MS and I get a vaccine, can it cause a relapse? And again, all the available literature, all the small studies pulled together show that no, vaccines do not cause an MS relapse. Now, the caveat is they may cause a pseudo relapse if you get a vaccine and have a small fever or elevation in your body temperature, right? Anyone who's sensitive to overheating in MS might notice some of their old symptoms come back, but they don't seem to cause new damage due to the MS and new inflammation. The third question is, well, what if I'm on a disease-modifying therapy? Is it safe to get vaccines, and are the vaccines as effective? So here we t talk about the two different types of vaccines. So there are dead or inactivated forms of vaccines, and those are typically safe. And in fact, they're very much encouraged depending on what you're up for, especially the flu vaccine that's seasonal. Um, the second type of vaccine, though, is a live vaccine. So things like yellow fever, um, things like that, chickenpox, those may not be safe if you're on an immunosuppressive medication. So then it becomes a very personal question. But the big takeaways are that vaccines do not seem to cause MS, and they do not seem to trigger and relapse in people who have MS. And in fact, some vaccines might be protective later on uh, once somebody has the condition. Thank you very much. Now, before I even say thank you to everybody for being here tonight, I want everybody to thank our director of programs, Jennifer Falk over there, for coming up with all these questions for us to do with you all tonight, all right?
I also want to thank the MSU's and news staff that's here. I do want to thank all of our supporters that are here tonight as well, and all those that are not here tonight. Of course, I want to thank our panel, our other speakers, Dr. Owens, Jeffrey Siegel, okay, and all of you for being here, okay? We cannot do these programs if we don't have an attendance of people coming to them. So I want to thank you, everybody, great. Give you all selves a round of applause, all right? Again, we want to thank all of our supporters. We want to thank you all for being here. I got to thank our video guy, my video producer, Bill. He's been with us for eight plus years. Orlando Production, if anybody ever wants to see them. Again, let's thank our, th our panel. Everybody, thank you again. You all drive careful going home. <laughs>